Okay, hi there and uh, welcome to another in our series of growth and development profile videos. In this video we investigate Angola, which is Sub-Saharan Africa's third largest economy. Angola is an excellent country to use as a contextual example of a country rich in natural resources such as crude oil, gas and diamonds, but a country often afflicted by the natural resource, resource curse which fails to make the transition from low to middle and then higher income status. It's also a really good go-to example when thinking of the wider effects, the, uh, the wider impact of primary product dependency. Angola is the third largest country in sub-Saharan Africa. It's the second biggest export of oil. It also has a significant liquefied natural gas sector. However, uh, its ranking on Human Development Index is 147, that's considerably below their GNI per capita ranking. It's a country highly exposed to fluctuations in the price of oil. And crucially, it scores very poorly internationally when we rank countries in terms of competitiveness, corruption and ease of doing business. As happens to many countries dependent on exports of natural resources, when global commodity prices are high, economic growth, shown in this chart, is strong. The years from 2004 to 2008 in particular saw Angola growing by more than 10% per year. But a collapse in oil prices in 2015 globally dealt a heavy blow to the Angolan economy, causing a steep deterioration in their terms of trade and leading to a sharp drop, as we can see, in growth and also in government tax revenues. Indeed, real GDP growth for Angola has struggled to recover ever since. A reminder... That countries with a narrow export base and a lack of diversification are highly exposed to shocks in the world economy. A wider effect is that having borrowed extensively during the good times when growth was strong, uh, predominantly from China, but also in the form of euro bonds, Angola's external debt has more than trebled to over 60% of GDP. Now, one important feature of uh, Angola, a lower middle income country, it's formerly a Portuguese colony, is that it ranks poorly in terms of a number of widely quoted international rankings. Uh, this includes a position as a country with one of the worst reputations for corruption. Most of the mining wealth has disappeared in the form of into the hands of the political elites, particularly after the end of the Civil War. James Hall Reuters Africa correspondent, superb Twitter stream to follow, refers to the endemic corruption issue in a recent tweet. Angola is recovering bit by bit the billions of dollars stolen by Eduardo dos Santos and his pals. So as usual, let's quickly look at some of the key human development indicators for Angola, drawing on the latest data from the 2019 Human Development Index. One thing I'll point out here, and by the way, it's a good idea to take a snapshot of, of the screen when we get to the full version. One idea I want to focus on here is the gap between uh, GNI per capita and HDI ranking. In theory, uh, Angola is a country whose GNI per capita, per PPP adjusted over $5,000, uh, should lead to a better ranking on the overall human development index, which of course gives an equal weighting to income education and health. But as we can see from the table on the right hand side, Angola is uh, it's, it's GNI per capita ranking 16 places higher than HDI. And that suggests, of course, that their relative performance in education and in health uh, is weak. For example, in 2018, according to the World Bank, Angola only had one physician, uh, less than 23 healthcare workers and 60 nurses per 10,000 people. So Angola would fit into that group of countries listed and shown there whose GNI per capita ranking is well above their HDI ranking. Officially, the Gini coefficient is 0.43, but most analysts believe that the true scale of income inequality in Angola is much, much higher. Indeed, the Gini coefficient could even be above 0.6, which would put it among the highest levels of inequality in the world. Angola has a, a, a very young population. 
Indeed, it has one of the lowest median ages in the world, 16.7 years, and healthy life expectancy is only 55 years. One third of the population live in severe multi-dimensional poverty. Millions of people in Angola are in poverty or close to poverty in its multi-dimensional sense. This data chart reinforces what we've just seen, that just under half the population uh, in 2018 is aged 14 years and under. And only 2% of the Angolan population is aged 65 years and above. Uh, Angola, again, is a good example of a country whose non-income poverty indicators uh, bear some scrutiny. Infant and maternal mortality, uh, those rates remain amongst the highest in the world. If you look at the, the orange triangle here, Angola relative to middle income country average has significantly higher mortality rates for under fives, malnutrition and maternal mortality. And other aspects of this, of course, the population lack access to safe drinking water, again, one of the highest figures in the world. Uh, Angola also features in the countries in the world most affected by hunger, according to the 2019 Global Hunger Index. Inadequate infrastructure is shown in this chart, which reveals that nearly one person in five in Angola does not have access to electricity. Angola is an oil-dependent country, with oil accounting for around 30% of its GDP and 95% of exports. Their growth over the last 10 years, we've seen the, the change from high growth to recession and then low growth. The average annual growth of GDP is just 2.2%. And actually, that kind of growth rate of just over 2% is barely enough to exceed population expansion. So, so per capita incomes in real terms have stayed fairly stagnant in the last few years. Inflation is high, we'll come to that in a second, 17%. Unemployment relatively low, uh, but of course a lot of hidden unemployment. The fiscal balance is negative, impacted by the fall in oil tax revenues. It still runs a current account surplus, but the heavy borrowing that Angola engaged in has meant that their external debt has more than trebled since 2012, from 16% to 60%. Again, national savings are less than investment spending, you know, suggesting a need for external finance. Angola is one of those go-to examples of a country highly dependent on one or just a few primary products. Over 90% of their exports of goods are linked to crude, uh, crude petroleum. Uh, staggeringly, lack, staggeringly low level of economic complexity in Angola. And here's just a few indicators of the, of the size of their fossil fuels industry in terms of both output of oil and also in terms of proven oil and gas reserves. Uh, they're also a significant diamond production country. Russia leads the way. Botswana uh, is a good example of a country which has reached relatively high income status on the back of natural resources. Angola there comes in seventh in terms of the world's biggest diamond producers. In addition to diamonds, uh, the country also produces gold, granite, marble, salt and as we can see here, uh, quite a significant liquefied natural gas market share increasing as the as time goes on. Uh, other key macro background on Angola, the currency unit is the Kwanzaa. Now, for many years, the Kwanzaa was linked or pegged to the US dollar. But in 2018, Angola decided to move away from a fixed exchange rate system to a more of a managed floating system. With inflation at 17%, you'd expect interest rates to be pretty high. Indeed, they are 15%. Angola is a member of the newly created African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, but it has relatively high corporation tax at 30%, which, along with other factors, can cause a, a, a limited incentive to invest in the country. Here's the data on inflation for Angola. Oftentimes, in an exam question, they'll choose a country which has had high inflation, and you can see that in, in certainly in context of advanced countries, inflation in Angola is significantly higher, peaking at over 30% in 2016. That in turn was the result of a significant depreciation of their exchange rate. High inflation uh, is a threat 
to growth for both advanced and developing countries. Uh, inflation of this kind of speed, double digit percentage rises in prices each year, uh, cuts the real incomes of people and often Im impacts uh, the poorest households hardest. So in that sense, it's regressive. It can inf uh, high inflation can lower the returns on planned investment. It leads to higher interest rates on loans, and crucially, from a government perspective, it increases the pressures for food and fuel subsidies, increasing government spending. Uh, high inflation can also undermine social stability, and lead to increased political tensions. And economic and political uncertainty is a risk that overseas investors then have to build into their calculations. Interestingly, with Angola, uh, it has a dual exchange rate. Now, a dual exchange rate occurs when there's a fixed official exchange rate, shown here in brown, uh, with the uh, between the uh, Angolan Kwanzaa and the US dollar. Uh, as, but that's supplemented by an illegal, if you like, market-determined parallel exchange rate. And that's shown in orange, orangey brown in this chart. And you can see that over the years there's been a really persistent, often huge gap between the street exchange rate, if you like, uh, for the bulk of financial transactions and the official exchange rate in Angola. Notice how the, the uh, if you like, the parallel exchange rate, the street exchange rate, is much more closely aligned to the world price of oil. Well, Angola is an example of a country that has just recently moved from a pegged fixed exchange rate to a more of a managed floating system. They were forced to do this essentially because they were running out of foreign exchange reserves in 2018. The world price of oil was much lower than expected. Angola's foreign exchange was, was suffering. Uh, and so the Angolan Central Bank scrapped its currency peg. The result was, as you can see, in 2018, uh, early part of 2018, a significant depreciation of the official exchange rate against the dollar from 150 Kwanzaa to over 400 Kwanzaa to the dollar, a significant depreciation of the exchange rate. So Angola is a good example of a country that's moved its system. And you might, for example, want to think about the, the possible advantages to Angola of switching from a fixed to a managed floating exchange rate. What about growth and policies, growth and reform? Um, for each country that you study for a level, you should, you should have one or two examples to hand in your revision notes of economic policy reforms often built around supply side economic policies. So the backstory here is Angola did well during the good years and when growth uh, was supplemented by high oil prices, but they can't rely on this anymore. So the Angolan government is now introducing a series of economic reforms designed to improve the business climate and make the country more attractive to inflows of, of uh, foreign investment. Uh, well, uh, one is ending the fixed currency peg with the US dollar to have a more floating exchange rate. Uh, secondly, a new private investment law has been brought in that allows international investors to put money into Angola without the need to partner with locals. They have relaxed visa restrictions to facilitate skilled uh, immigration of labour. And there's been a start on the privatisation of, of many of their state-owned enterprises. I guess the crucial longer-term objective for Angola is to speed up the diversification of the economy to widen the export base. And the private investment law is quite a good example to use. They're trying to bring investment into Angola so there's now no minimum amount of investment needed to start a project. Previously there was. There's no obligation to share equity capital with a national investor. Previously there was. Like many countries, they've created priority sectors and also established development zones. Many countries now go for these special economic zones with particular investment incentives. And crucially, uh, investors' rights include the repatriation of dividends, royalties and other incomes. In other words, if you put money into Angola... And make a profit that money can leave the country and go back to the country of origin loads of reasons you might want to use angola as a contextual example in your economics exams it's a good example of a country where we see the limits of having a narrow export and broad and narrow economic base uh, angola is a good example of a country which has many of those classic development barriers inadequate infrastructure um, corruption is endemic, institutions are weak. 
For the example of a country that's changed its exchange rate system, there are pluses and minuses of doing that. And a country which faces the fundamental challenge of turning rich natural resources, turning that resource wealth into human capital to lift productivity and per capita incomes. And it's a country with high inflation, persistently high inflation, in part caused by a weak currency. What are the risks to growth and development from having persistently high rates of inflation? So hopefully you might think that Angola is a good example of a country to have in your notes on development and growth as part of your preparation for the economics exams. Thank you.